Dear Muslims, around a thousand years ago, or 922 to be precise, in August of the year 1099, one of the great senior ulama of the Ummah, a judge appointed by the Sultan, by the name of Al-Qadi Abu Sa'ad Al-Harawi, he was granted an audience in the palace of the Khalifa, the Abbasid Khalifa in Baghdad. This Khalifa is al mustadhir Billah. And he entered into this palace. He took off his turban and he was shaved, which is a sign of humility. Nobody appeared in public back then with their hair uncovered in Baghdad, except if you were a pilgrim. He had shaved his hair and he went with a group of people in tattered clothings with blood still on their garments. They weren't dressed properly, disheveled, tired, clearly not from the people of Baghdad. And he entered into the chamber of the Khalifa. The Khalifa was sitting on his throne and he began thundering in a loud voice, which is not done in the presence of the Khalifa. And he said, how dare you be sitting here? How dare you enjoy the comforts of this dunya, eating and drinking and living like this? When your own brethren in a sham have been slaughtered, when Baytul Maqdis has been conquered, how can you be sitting here and doing nothing when our brothers and sisters are, in the, are inside of the bellies of vultures and our sisters are being dishonored and here you are doing nothing. And he brought forth the people that were with him and they turned out to be survivors of the massacre of Jerusalem. And he asked them to describe in vivid detail what they had seen. And they were clearly tired, disheveled. They had come straight from Jerusalem to Baghdad. And as the descriptions continued, the Khalifa lowered his head in shame. The entire room became quiet. And at the end of that conversation, the Khalifa promised to do something about the matter. And why would not the Khalifa of the Muslims lower his head in shame? After what happened in July of 1099, barely two weeks before the Qadi entered Baghdad, how could not the entire Ummah lower its head in shame because of the realities of the conquest of Jerusalem in July of 1099? Because it was in that month that a group of Europeans, commonly called Crusaders, and they were a motley group, a group of different people, some of them noblemen, some of them peasants, some of them educated, most of them illiterate, groups from all over Europe, from what is now England and France and Germany. They had made their way traveling from Europe all the way across the European lands through what is now Bulgaria, what is now called Turkey, what is now called Syria, making their way through all of these lands, pillaging, murdering, raping. Months had gone by. Everybody knows they're coming. And they come and they land outside or they, or they situate themselves outside of Jerusalem and they lay siege to Jerusalem. And then on the 15th of July, 1099, a day that we should all remember and know, the 15th of July, 1099, they entered the city of Jerusalem and they began massacring the inhabitants of the city, man, woman, and child, Muslim, Jew, and even Christian that was not a part of their sect of Christianity. Everybody in the city was massacred. Even those who were inside the masjid, even those who sought refuge in the Aqsa complex, the entire city, one of the most brutal executions and slaughters in all of medieval history took place from the 15th of July onwards. And it wasn't a one day event, brothers and sisters, because there were no bombs back then. There was no nuclear weapon, you press the button. There were no missiles that come in from apartheid regimes. No, the way you kill people back then was one person at a time via the sword. So for days, and I want you to think about that after the khutbah is over and you go home, for days, Muslims were tied up, lined up, Families put women and children. They know the fate, but it's not their turn yet. And one after the other, those barbarians who called themselves warriors of Jesus, and they have nothing to do with Jesus Christ. They stood there and they slaughtered every single human being who lived in the city. More than a hundred thousand innocent lives were lost over the course of a week. The chroniclers who record the event, they mention 
with pride that the streets of Jerusalem are filled with blood. One of them mentioned the blood reached his ankles as he's walking in the streets. Another European chronicler visited Jerusalem one year later. The next year, in the year, uh, in the year 1100, he visited Jerusalem and he said the stench of the bodies and of the rotting corpses after a year was so bad that he had to cover his nose with his sleeve as he walked into the city. How could we not collectively hang our heads in shame because of what happened in the year 1099? And it remained in the hands of the Crusaders for three entire generations. Not the children of that generation, not the grandchildren of that generation, the great grandchildren and the great great grandchildren lived to see the return of Jerusalem on the hands of that great military general that we call Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi in the famous Battle of Hittin in 1187. So from 1099 to 1187, the Crusaders occupied Jerusalem as we are all aware. Now the story of the Crusades is one of the most important events historically, one of the most greatest tragedies as well. And there is much to benefit from. And obviously we only have one khutbah, but I strongly encourage all of you to read about this event because it has so much that we need to learn from and benefit from, especially given the circumstances of our times. Given the fact that time is limited, I want to concentrate as somebody who's read a little bit, I'm not an expert in history, but it is one of my areas that I love to read about. I want to derive three benefits from this era from the Crusades. Three benefits that insha'Allah ta'ala, I want us to think about in light of the current situation. Firstly, the question arises, how could the Muslim Ummah have lost Jerusalem? Was it not during its prime and pinnacle? Was there not a glorious Khilafah known as the Abbasids? How could a group of ragtag, motley crew coming all the way from Europe, inching their way, walking on foot, some of them, how could they come all the way from France and nobody does anything to stop them? Where were the Salatin? Where were the Khulafa? Where were the Ghazis? Where were the Seljuks? Where was everybody? How could this have happened? And when you study Islamic history, you realize what we are seeing then, we are seeing right now. You see, brothers and sisters, many of us have a romanticized view of the past. We are taught things that are almost like mythology when we're children. And you know, when we're children, it's fine to romanticize the past, no problem. It's fine you, you know, spice up some details and cut off some negative things, that's fine. But if adults continue to believe in the past as a fairy tale, in Islamic history as not the real history, but a romanticized history, well then they're going to repeat the same lessons and the same problems of the past, they're going to repeat them. As adults, we need to grow up and we need to call a spade a spade. As adults, we need to examine history critically and learn from the mistakes of the previous generations so that we don't repeat them. The fact of the matter is that the primary reason we lost Jerusalem back then is exactly the reason why we don't have Jerusalem now. And that is that, no, we didn't have Muslim unity. We didn't have it back then and we don't have it now. The fact of the matter is that the Muslim world was divided into many different mini kingdoms, many different governorships, many different principalities. There weren't 52 countries as there are now. There wasn't an OIC with a nominal leader. No, but there were governorships. There were mini dynasties and kingdoms. There were plenty of states that were competing with one another and each one wanted its own power and the Khalifa was simply a Khalifa in name in reality by this point in time the Abbasid Khalifa was a token figure it was the Seljuks who were in charge the Abbasid Khalifa didn't even have an army even if he wanted to declare an army he had no army the power was in the hands of other mini dynasties and do you know, brothers and sisters, do you know that while the Crusaders were inching their way into Muslim territory, Muslims, these dynasties, these kingdoms, just like we see now, were fighting amongst themselves. They were waging war against each other, each one trying to capture the land of the other. 
As they're fighting and literally in their backyards, the crusaders are inching on and they're thinking it's a trivial matter. I need to fight with my cousin. I need to fight with my brother so that I control the larger share of the pie. And I'm not joking when I say my brother. I'm not joking at all. In fact, one of the most uh, painful episodes, one of the most painful episodes during the year that the Crusaders conquered Jerusalem, a few months before this incident, two blood brothers, both of them from the Seljuq dynasty, Ridwan and Duqaq, two blood brothers, one of them controlled Halab, Aleppo, and the other controlled Damascus, Damascus. They were fighting one another, each one wanting the territory of the other. The same year that the Crusaders are inching their way in Bilad al-Sham, two blood brothers, forget distant relatives, forget competing kingdoms that both say the kalima they had the same father and they're fighting one another for the kursi don't think that anything you're seeing today is new the same realities of the past internal strife civil war greed wanting more dunya and because of this what's going to happen the enemy is going to come in and right behind their backs go and conquer jerusalem and then when jerusalem is actually conquered do you know what the seljuks basically said and did or the people of that time, the Seljuk leaders amongst them, they basically shrugged their shoulders and said, well, technically the Fatimids conquered Jerusalem. It's their business, not ours. And that is because the Fatimid dynasty and the Seljuk dynasty were battling over control of Jerusalem. And it so happened a decade before the Crusaders that the Fatimids had won over the Seljuks. So the Seljuks washed their hands and said, it's your business, you deal with it. You conquered it from us, go ahead, you protect it. So nobody ended up. The Fatimids were based in Cairo, they were based in Egypt, and they're like, yeah, that's so far away. He's going to go there. Basically, enemies within the ummah fighting over power. And in the meantime, the outside enemy comes and simply takes Jerusalem. We need to learn from this, brothers and sisters. We need to find as much unity as we can within our own ranks. One of the other lessons we learned from the Crusades, the second lesson, is that there was no quick fix. It didn't happen overnight. 90 years it took. And during that time frame, during that time frame, many were the people who attempted in different ways to do so. And Allah's will that it took place in the hands or on the hands of Salah al-Din al -Ayubi. But the fact of the matter is, while Salah al-Din is considered the hero and he deserves the title of hero, the main brains and the main person behind the reconquest was the mentor of Salah al-Din, Nuruddin al-Zangi. And Nuruddin al-Zangi was the one who for his entire life was trying to get Jerusalem back. He made it his life mission and goal. He made it his life mission and goal to return Jerusalem to the Ummah. And he tried unsuccessfully many different ways, doing this, doing that, waging jihad, forming unification. But it was Allah's Qadr, it was Allah's Qadr that Nuruddin al-Zangi died and Jerusalem was not Conquered. History remembers Nuruddin al Zangi. We know his name, but his reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without Nuruddin al Zangi, there would be no Salah al Din al Ayyubi. Why is this? What do we learn from this? Brothers and sisters, we need to lay the foundation for future generations. We don't know the impact of what's going to happen. Nuruddin al Zangi saw this young teenager by the name of Yusuf. His actual name is Yusuf. He saw this young teenager by the name of Yusuf and he saw potential in him. 18 years old and he took him under his wing. He trained him. He gave him power. He sent him here and there. And slowly but surely Salah al Din began to rise. When Nuruddin passed away, still it took Salah al Din another decade. But the vision of Nuruddin was actually materialized after the death of Nuruddin al-Zangi. We don't know what efforts we're going to do is going to bring fruition. We can't necessarily look at the prize in our lifetimes. We have to plant the seeds, put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Insha'Allah, Allah shall reward Nuruddin for all that he deserves, even though he didn't see with his own eyes the conquest of Jerusalem. And we need to learn from this long-term planning. We might not see success in our lifetimes, but we need to think a generation ahead like Nuruddin Azangi did. The third lesson that we can derive, and of course the details are beyond the scope of the khutbah, but inshallah you can trust me on this. I have read enough books to derive some lessons from the, from the Crusades. The third lesson we can derive, the question arises, why did it take 90 years even? I mean, after all, once Jerusalem is taken, why doesn't the ummah come together? I mean, think about it. We had an entire ummah surrounding Jerusalem of Muslims. Hundreds, thousands of people that, are, that can fight. 
dozens of dynasties and there was but one small city or one small group of European crusaders that had overtaken Jerusalem. Why did it take so long? We go back to point number one and which is the same issue of why the delay took place and that is that even after the conquest of Jerusalem uh, by, by the crusaders there was internal bickering, there was backstabbing, there was rivalry between the dynasties and even those that were fighting for the same cause issues happen between them and again because of the difficult times we live in we need to be a little bit blunt and, and, and teach us some, rel some lessons that open our eyes these are not romanticized facts this is raw history the sad reality brothers and sisters is that Salahuddin al Ayyubi and Nuruddin al Zangi are both great people we respect and admire them but shaitan got between the two of them as Salahuddin rose in power things happened between Nuruddin and him and awkwardness and anger and acrimony Salahuddin became in charge of Egypt Nuruddin is in charge of Syria and the two of them began to have harsh words so much so that there was a potential for a war between two great men it's not the first time the Sahaba also had some misunderstandings and things happened politics is politics subhanallah and those there were many who criticized Salah ad -Din. There were many who were opponents of Salah ad -Din. And if you look at his resume, he was a politician. He was a general. Politicians are not ulama. Politicians have to do things that are gray. Politicians do things that are the lesser of two evils. So those who want perfection, you're not going to find it in a politician. Politicians, by their nature, they make the best of a very difficult situation. I thank Allah, I'm not a politician. I would never be a successful one. Ulama, du'at, people of Islamic knowledge are a different category and politicians are a different category. Nuruddin had to do things. The khutbah is not the time to get into them. He worked for the Fatimids, by the way. Over a decade, he's working for a heretical regime. You know who the Fatimids were? He was their prime minister. He's working for them. And then eventually he does a coup d'etat. Certain things happen, deaths occur. Nuruddin passes away and he re reconciles with the Zangid dynasty by marrying the wife of Nuruddin. Things are there. It's a gray area. If you want a saint in a politician, you're never going to find one. Politicians and saints don't go together. That's why, dear brothers and sisters, my point for here, number three, it's a very difficult one. But if you want people to benefit the ummah, the fact of the matter is those that are actually doing the job in politics, you cannot expect them to be saints and ulama. They're not walking angels. The politicians that are the most successful are those that make the best of a really bad situation. They're not those that are completely innocent. The era of the Khulafa al-Rashidun is gone. That was the only time, those four, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali radiallahu anhum, the only time when the best of the Ummah was in charge of the Ummah. That's why we call it Khulafa al-Rashidun. After that, what happened, happened. So in our time frame, brothers and sisters, you're gonna find people those who want to criticize will find plenty to criticize because nobody is an angel in that realm. We have to look overall at people who are benefiting the ummah, even if they have some mistakes amongst them. The next Salah ad-Din al-Ayubi that comes along, and there will be coming, no doubt about it, because Jerusalem is our land and Allah will return it to us. The next Salah ad-Din al-Ayubi that comes along, I guarantee you, as he's rising to power, you're going to have a bunch of people whose expertise is just criticizing. They do nothing except sit in their armchairs and criticize anybody who does everything else. We have to ignore the professional full-time critics because they get nothing done as they find fault with everybody else. You will not find a walking angel that is a politician in general. And much can be said, I don't want to ruin your impression of some of these people, but the fact of the matter when you read their biographies, you have to do what you have to do as a king, as a ruler, as a leader, as a general. It's not all clean. And sometimes you do things which is the lesser of the two, but you do a lot of good for the ummah. And you end up a hero, and those things that you did are basically ignored for the average person, which is fine. But now, when we're studying history, and we're seeing a repeat of that time when Jerusalem is gone, we have to be careful that we don't fall into the camp of the critics, who all they could do is look at Salah ad -Din and look at Nur ad -Din and talk a lot and do nothing. Sometimes those that benefit the ummah are not going to be perfect angels, but they'll still end up benefiting the ummah. These are three simple lessons that I wanted to derive from that time frame. And as we conclude the first khutbah, we remind ourselves that last time Jerusalem was in crusader hands for almost 90 years. 
This year we are seeing the 73rd year since Palestine and our brothers in Palestine were expelled and we are in year 54 since East Jerusalem was invaded because actually East Jerusalem Aqsa it was only invaded in the Six Day War in the 1960s when they captured Al-Aqsa. We do not know how many more years Al-Aqsa will be in the hands of those that do not deserve it but we have to have Yaqeen and we do have Yaqeen that eventually the rightful owners of Al-Aqsa will be the ones that are in control of it and Al-Aqsa will be liberated of that we have absolutely no doubt whatsoever because Allah says in the Quran I have decreed that I and my prophets are going to win and we are on the side of the prophets and we will inshallah ta'ala win may Allah Azza wa Jal bless me and you with and through the Quran and may he make us of those who its verses they understand and applies halal and haram throughout our lifespan I ask Allah's forgiveness you as well ask him for he is the ghafoor and the rahman Alhamdulillah al wahid al ahad al samad الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد وبعده. Allow me to address one of the causes of concerns that I myself have witnessed in the last two weeks, and because this is something that is relevant to us as the Muslim community, I feel it is very important that again I am explicit about this. In the last two weeks, as we saw what's happening in Al Aqsa. And many of us got involved online and giving khutab and durus and putting them on the internet and whatnot. What we saw was the worrying reality of attacks and hatred between the ummah and between different groups, all of whom love Al-Aqsa and all of whom want to free Al-Aqsa. People have different ways and solutions to the problem. It's not a one-pronged solution. And different people are attracted to different ways to solve the problem. That's great. The problem comes when a person who is persuaded to go one way feels that somebody who's going the other way is an enemy, even though the goal is the same, even though the goal is the pleasure of Allah and the liberation of Al-Aqsa. We cannot take other Muslims as our enemies just because they disagree about the best procedure and path to go. I understand tensions are high. I understand bombs are being dropped. I understand we see these images and understandably we are angry, but we cannot allow the mistakes of the past, the disunity that shook the ummah for so long. We cannot allow it to affect us again. We have to learn from the past. Subhanallah, we saw with our own eyes when people were raising funds for Al-Aqsa and Alhamdulillah lots of funds were raised so many people objected to raising funds and they said until you established a khilafa all of these funds are useless subhanallah you go ahead and establish in the meantime there's a child dying of hunger I need to feed this child your criticism of me raising funds is neither gonna help you nor me nor feed this child what have you gained another person stands and wants to go to a rally and the person stands up and says until you fix our internal theology there's no point going to the rally subhanallah fix the theology and also go to the rally until you pray Fajr there's no point writing to your congressman ya khi, come pray Fajr with me then let's type up the letter together to the congressman why is it either this or that why is it my way or the highway can't you understand that different people have different talent and different passions and you do not know where and what is going to benefit the ummah we just saw a political strategy help out we don't know what caused that strategy one of the Palestinian congress people spoke to our president the next day a call was done and something happened did that impact or not maybe it did maybe it didn't but the point is we do not know what will be the best and why dear Muslims why can't we agree to have different ways to help Al-Aqsa why is it only one thing until we pray Fajr in the masjid okay pray Fajr and also do something else correct your aqidah and do something else can't we come together and understand that as long as everybody has the same goal we work with different ways don't take other Muslims as your enemy. If you don't agree with that methodology, fine, don't sign up to that cause, but do something. 
what you cannot do, what you should not do is waste your time and mine and the Ummah's time by sitting at home and just criticizing and criticizing and criticizing. Because Wallahi brothers and sisters, we now have in our ranks professional critics who do absolutely nothing except sit in their father's basements and type away and give sermons from YouTube and they don't do a single benefit of the Ummah except find fault with everybody else. Just like in the time of Nurdin and Salah Haddin, there were people who sat and criticized and did nothing. Okay, we agree. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Show me a better way and inshallah ta'ala, we will join you. But until you do that, what is the point of creating animosity and hatred within the Ummah? And dear brothers and sisters, we have a group that yes, we should hate. And those are Muslims that have allied with the forces of evil. Why not take them as an enemy? Anybody who allies with apartheid regimes, anybody who supports directly this type of, of bombing and whatnot. And there are people amongst us that are doing this. That is the enemy. Those are the munafiqs. Can't we understand that if people have a different way to get to the goal, fi kullin khair, inshallah, there's good in all. You do what you're doing, I'm doing what I'm doing, and inshallah, together we are under the umbrella of La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Brothers and sisters, let us, let us learn from Badr and Uhud, the battle of Badr and the battle of Uhud. What does Allah say about the battle of Badr? In Surah Al-Anfal, Allah says, وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا do not differ and argue amongst yourselves. If you do so, you will fail. Do not differ and argue amongst yourselves. Join your ranks, close. Even if you disagree, go ahead and come together for the sake of Allah. And when they did that, Badr was a success. What happened at Uhud? Allah Azza wa Jal explains in Surah Ali Imran, Hatta idha fashiltum wa tanazatum fil amr. When you despaired and you started bickering amongst yourselves. In the battle of Badr, you didn't differ. Allah gave you victory. In the battle of Uhud, you began fighting and differing amongst yourselves. And because of that, Uhud happened. Muslims, there is no easy way forward. I don't know the best way, but neither do you. Nobody does. You do what you think is beneficial. I do what I think is beneficial. And may Allah Azza wa put barakah in your efforts and my efforts. We are not enemies simply because we disagree about the most effective strategy. Don't take each other as targets. Come together for the greater good. We do have an enemy. And that enemy is the outside apartheid regime. And inside, anybody who supports them, anybody who allies with them, anybody who has treaties with them, yes, they are the munafiqun let's group together against those people no problem but the people of iman the people of taqwa the people of the kalima the people who clearly want to benefit the muslims of al-aqsa and the ummah even if you disagree disagree with politeness disagree with adab and let them do their thing and make dua for them make dua may allah bless you in your work and then you show a better way and you know what Allah Azza wa Jal will bless the people of sincerity and the people of taqwa be amongst them. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for ikhlas and